And hello. This is an experimental thing here. Setting this up. I hope it works immediately. Right, I'm gonna talk about commonness. We already heard the talk by Andreas and you have le learned all the lessons you can. So I don't think there's a lot much more to talk about, but um, Ignacy and I, we will, swip, uh, we will sw um, swap our, our positions here, uh, thought about what we could actually tell you. And um, we came up with two or three points we wanna make, and then I, I hope we can, we can take it from there. So uh, just to remind you, commonness is really two spectrographs. We built this, this uh, the setup uh, when we start more than 10 years ago uh, now 2011 or so was was the first real meeting and um, it's it's a visual room temperature uh, spectrograph and a near ir and those those two are supposed to have no gaps in between okay we have a dichroic of course but the light is going in and the light is going into two spectrographs and we're covering uh, 520 nanometers up to 1.7 micron in each shot with two instruments of course but um and the idea at that point was to really understand what we are doing in high resolution spectroscopy. The idea was not to build the most fancy, most super stabilized instrument that one, ever, anyone could build, in particular not in the near, near IR, because this is not something that anyone had done before. And we were not aiming at like 10 centimeters per second, okay? We were really trying to get where we could um, as, as soon as fast as possible and then explore this wavelength range and ask the question, where do we actually need to focus if we want to find planets, and then of course we want to find planets. Um, this is the the spectral format at the end that we we, we will get we are getting. This is uh, down. You see the the high resolution. It's ninety thousand around ninety thousand um, uh, in R, and we are covering this entire wavelength range. And just just as a as a um, question to everyone who shows wavelength ranges as large as this, please always show logarithmic lambda. Otherwise, we all get totally confused, okay? So the, the information content is in, is in the log lambda, not in lambda itself. Otherwise, this, this area, area would be totally uh, dominating and that would be unfair. In this, is, this is the amount of uh, information that we have. Um, and our, our, main, our main business for the first couple of years, I think before planets really popped out and before we could really start uh, to work on this, and Ignazi will talk more about the science uh, after me, um, is really asking this question, uh, where, should we, where should we look? And you all know that there's a flux dependence of, uh, from, of different stars with different um, surface temperatures. And the general idea was, or, or the general motivation to go infrared was always that there's more flux in the red if you go to cooler stars. Um, that is actually true for all the stars. The sun, I mean, our, our spectrographs are called, counting photons, and that means that uh, even for the sun, the peak of the photon distribution is very much in the red. So it's always a good idea if you want to have high signal noise spectra to go to the red, but there's not, not that many, there's not that uh, much spectral information, um, RV information. And this is a plot that came out essentially from the Carmenes um, pro project, but also from many other projects, including a lot of Etienne's work, including um, looking at uh, models. So this shows you for different temperatures uh, where the radial velocity information really is. And I want you to look at the thing that you don't see actually. So why do you see, uh, this, is, this is here. Do I need to close this here? Okay, so you can see, so let's let's take for example the 3200 Kelvin star. This is a, your your um, pet M dwarf that you like, and we are asking the question: What is the RV photon noise? Just the amount of information that can we can theoretically get if we have a spectrograph with a resolution of 100,000 and we reach a signal noise of 100 in the V band. Whether you can do it or not with your spectrograph and your telescope, I don't care. I just care what kind of instrument do we build and put behind the mirror. Okay, and then the answer is. You want to look here. This is the this is the, the place where the RV photon noise is minimized. And then now you look at different colors. And I I uh, ask paper really um, if you will. but what we really found out is between 700 and 900 nanometers is the sweet spot for early M's mid M's. If you go really cool, of course you want to go really red down here. But as long as you are not below 3,000 Kelvin, an optical spectrograph is actually a very good idea. And there are many other reasons why we need near infrared. We are doing near infrared. I'm not saying we shouldn't, but um, I'm saying that the RV information content in the optical is, is really very high. 
Um, we came up or we, we provide a RV precision calculator that you may, may be interested in. So if you haven't seen that, we have a web page here. There's um, research and you cannot see this either, but just ask me uh, if you want to see that at some point. So you can, you can uh, pop in your favorite wavelength ranges, your favorite star here. You can even, con uh, even consult Simbad for that. And then it, it gives you the RV information content as a function of wavelength and wavelength combinations. And here, just as, a, as, a, as an example, you see um, our, our performance. So Carmenis stops exposure when we nominally reach an RV precision of one meter per second, or at least we believe, which is uh, about a signal noise of 150 in the J band for a nom nominal star, whatever that is. So for our sample, 300 M dwarfs plus or minus, we reach an average internal information content of our spectra that matches this, this, um, this goal. There's some, some weather patterns and, and stuff. So it's about 1.5, 1.6 meters per second here on average. And we shouldn't go into the, uh, into the discussions what actually uh, this is. But my point here, and this is the take home message, is if you stop exposures at that time when we have signal noise of 150 in J, this, the upper panel, is the photon noise that you get in the vis arm up to one micron in our case. And the lower thing is automatically what you get in the near. So this is always the comparison that you have to make. If you want to do better in the near infrared, you need each longer. Factor of three. So this, this, this is essentially the take message. And the most important thing, in addition to all the planets uh, that we have and, and many other things that we learned, uh, that we can give you. Uh, and here's the external precision. So the RMS, this is, uh, if you subtract in your head quadratically this plot from that, you get the RV jitter in the different, uh, in the different um, instruments. And I think I should hand over because we are already close. Okay. Okay. So in this second part, um, I'm going to be taking over and discussing a specific target that was addressed a couple of times of three times yesterday. Um, that's Barnard Star, of course, our favorite star and a, and a standard for many of the projects that we are after and we're involved in. And when I'm doing this, also taking the opportunity here to, because um, we've collected many more data points with Carmenes over the last few years compared to what was published in 2018. So we have another four years worth of data, another almost 500 measurements with Carmenes. And you may wonder, well, what's the star is up to? Uh, what can we say about the uh, candidate at 233 days and so on? So here's the analysis. We also have actually photometry. And uh, well, if you think the star is uh, quiet, well, think again. You, this is photometry, so you see actually 3% variations in flux over time scales of, um, of course, uh, months, actually. And these are very well uh, tracked or traced by the full width of half maximum, one of the indicators we have. So the same features, you can see a fairly strong variation that uh, Barnard had uh, here back in 2019 which is also clearly visible in full-width half-max and actually also visible in RVs. So there is a, a strong reflection of that um, when we come and, and, and analyze that. So now we have this, um, this kind of data set. Also, the important thing as well here is that we have a, a, a narrow season gap in Carmenes. We can, we can follow the star for 85% of the time of the year, so which means that we, uh, our gap between seasons is, is really small. And now we're using data that has been uh, a bit further processed to what was released in the VR1 paper that we had uh, a few um, weeks ago, actually. So this is Stoluric corrected in a more fancy way than what uh, what has been released, actually. So um, do we see a 233-day signal? No, we don't with this data. Actually, you see here, we actually have a 170-day signal that is popping out quite strongly, uh, only with this Carmenis data. And when we uh, run the injection retrieval experiments, many of them actually, we see that the, our detection limit is a, of order of 0.8 to one meter per second. So 1.1 uh, meter per second signal, in principle, we should be able to see at 230 days, which would actually be around here, right? So, but beyond that, um, what we've done as well is to simulate, to make mock um, um, Barnard stars, let's say, uh, assuming different uh, spot patterns on the surface, different, uh, filling factors and then letting them evolve over time with this star sim simulator that we have, producing time series rate velocities that would mimic in properties those that we have in Carmenes. And the thing is that you we see here, well, we inject, where we use a uh, rotation period in a range actually, and we see what happens only with, with rotation only. And we see, of course, the uh, 
many of the signals that pop out again at 140 days as expected, and there's a local minimum at 233. So the 233 signal cannot really be a one-year alias of this rotation because it's really not related here, and there's no maximum, and you expect to see that actually if this was the case. Uh, by the way, only in a tiny fraction of the simulations, we have a significant signal around 200 days and nothing at 140. So it's really unlikely that one has this configuration. Of course, it could happen, nature, but that's um, unlikely. And this was already said actually in the in the paper uh, in Nature because it's uh, uh, we already did that with GPs actually. So it shows that that the one year alias should not be the, expl the the explanation for the 230 day signal. Now we run all the data sets there are now, uh, the new HPF data set, the old data sets, uh, together with the 470 measurements from Carmenis. Um, and then what we see is that 230 days has actually increased in significance with all the data sets. Not very significantly from 32 to 38 uh, delta log likelihood, but it keeps increasing. So reason for that still unknown, but it seems that at least the new data are not killing this, the, the signal. Um, however, we actually find a lower amplitude for this signal. So it's now below, uh, below one meter per second, it's close to 0.8 meters per second. But again, still highly significant given the amount of data that we have. It's, now almost uh, 1,500 measurements, I think. So by the way, the increase in the significance was also seen by Jack Lubin uh, in collaborators in their HPF paper. Uh, they claim that it's not enough of an increase to actually uh, merit this detection, but still, uh, again, signal is building up. And just to close, um, we did some injection and retrieval experiments on, on again, the, the, uh, the simulated data and see if we could actually retrieve a Barnard B-like signal. And yeah, we can, but even in the 1.2 meter per second semi-amplitude case, we only retrieve the signal 38% of the cases. So many, many times you actually have destructive interference between the rotation period and the, uh, and the actual planet period. So there might be occasions where you are, in spite of having a fairly strong signal in the data, we don't see it just because of this destructive interference, because anyway, 140 and 230 are quite close in frequency space. So there's quite a bit of interference. If we go down to 0.8 meters per second amplitude, then it's only less than one in five um, um, simulations that uh, allow for to retrieve this signal. So anyway, I think the uh, jury is still out. And I don't, I mean, we still think that this is a candidate, a bona fide candidate planet. Still a lot more data will be required. And this illustrates maybe uh, even the amount of data one can, needs to get to actually make a call on one of these planets, and the fact that over a long, long time series, maybe you, temporarily you may lose a planetary signal, although it's bona fide planetary signal because of interference with, uh, with, um, with rotation modulation, then eventually come back. So I think that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ansgar and Ignacy. So we have time for one or two questions. Yes, Etienne. Yeah, uh, Zoom won't hear me. Okay, how much do you throw away from Telluric? So one way of losing domain is to reject it from Telluric. So is, is it linked to that or is it, uh, yeah. So how much do you throw? Yeah, um, not that much. So we we uh, we do have, I think we, you showed that on the uh, on one of the slides. So we do have a Telluric correction um, pipeline and we did the whole thing with Telluric, telluric um, corrected data. Of course you improve by, you can improve by one or two meters per second on average, I, I suppose but we didn't really see that much of a significant change. I mean, if you are asking the question, how much of the, of the area is contaminated? This is, this is a different question. How much, do we, how much do we throw away? That is a significant fraction, of course. But at least we, so far, have not been able to, to retrieve that much information out of the lost information that's there. You can correct for telluric contamination. The photons are gone. The signal to noise is low in that area. And that means that um, it's not possible to really um, to, to reconstruct a spectrum that is sort of the same signal noise everywhere, even after after modeling the total Telurix. I'm sorry, I'm gonna hammer on that one too. I, 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 I take your point that yes, the red optical as a, is an optimum, and we can see that in many instruments, Meronex, for example, in your instrument. 
but your performance in an EIR, sorry, <clears throat> your performance in an EIR is specific to Carmenas. I'm sorry, but we do much better than that with, with SPEW and now and, and now with NIRPS. We have the same aperture telescope. We do we 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 do we do much better than that. And so you've been saying that for years that the infrared sucks, but we do as good as as your as your optical performance. I'm sorry. Okay, don't try. Maybe I can answer that. I think we we have looked into several data sets together over the over the last couple of years, and I I, I disagreed what you were saying. I totally agree that 3.6 meter telescopes, we were, you were doing great work. You were reaching one uh, meters per second better than we do, but the the reason is that you are exposing three times longer than we do. So you 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 yes you are. Okay, maybe that's a good start for the discussion. But uh, we thank the speakers again and. And we will move to the next one. So, uh, Stefanson, and are you sharing your talk or? Yeah. No, I mean, are you sharing with uh, Joe or? Yeah. Okay. Ah, okay. So I give you the mic. Joe. Uh, can you, do you want to try and uh, speak just to check if we are, can you hear you? Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Uh, maybe it's a bit uh, muted, but can you try again? Uh, yes. Just give me a second. Uh, it was actually better before. No, it was better, I guess, in the, in the very beginning. Then we could actually hear you, but now I guess it's gone. Oh, I see. Uh, okay, now, now we can hear you. Okay, so keep it like that. Okay, okay, okay. Great. okay. So okay. let me see. Maybe I'll uh, make this slightly smaller over here. Um, slideshow. Okay, and for the soup, people on Zoom can see. So. Yeah, I get, we can see on Zoom. Okay, wonderful. So yeah, um, uh, hello everyone. Um, uh, it's uh, my name is Guimadur, and uh, I'm tag teaming this. Um, um, then talk with with Joe, who's online, and we're going to be talking about uh, precision RVs uh, with HPF. And uh, let's just dive right in. So a quick overview um, slide. Uh, we can see how much we can actually uh, go over um, here. Just very briefly, we want to talk a little bit about the on-sky RV performance of HPF. We touched on this a bit um, during the, the talk yesterday. Um, then talk about detector effects, uh, really sort of looking uh, down under the hood on some of the details and uh, things like that. Look at temperatures and uh, a lot of nitty degree temper uh, detector effects. Uh, few words about observational benefits and then uh, future improvements and uh, primarily focusing on the, the the things in bold here but then we have backup slides if asked needed for the discussion um, just very briefly uh, we touched on this yesterday HPF is a near infrared uh, spectrograph on the 10 meter hobby ability telescope resolution 55,000 we cover um, uh, wavelength range from 810 to 1280 nanometers um, we've done H2RG with a 1.7 micron cutoff and um, the 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 custom built uh, comb uh, seen over there is really essential to allow us to obtain uh, precise uh, RVs with with HPF. Um, some notes on the uh, RV performance showed this yesterday. Barna Star uh, that we all uh, know and love. Um, we get an RMS maintained uh, over years of around two meters per second. Uh, the actual photo noise is around uh, that we get uh, given our exposures in 30 minute bins is about 80 centimeters per second. So a combination there uh, of the increased RMS is due to uh, then um, instrumental effects and then also, um, also, also stellar activity. Then another uh, SPF survey target over there maintained over uh, four year baseline uh, showing an RMS of um, um, somewhat improved of 1.6 meters per second. There are a number of standard stars that we observe uh, as part uh, of a routine HPF observations and engineering observations, uh, yeah, including Mara star, star and, and some of the other um, targets over there. Um, then what does the LFC actually reveal? Uh, I showed this yesterday as well, uh, showing the absolute RV drifts uh, of HPF. Um, and here, this is then really uh, where the comb uh, really shines and allows us to um, uh, precisely monitor the absolute uh, drifts of HPF. There are a number of bumps and wiggles over here due to observatory power failures and then routine uh, pumping of the liquid nitrogen fill and ventosis. And then here is when we did uh, a thermal cycle after which we're seeing somewhat larger um, then RV 
uh, RV drifts there. And uh, the band uh, over here is uh, due to a 24 hour um, liquid nitrogen fill cycle, which I, I show uh, actually in further detail in the next slide. But I want to show you this um, uh, plot, which um, plots in a few different uh, parameters of interest, showing here the temperature of the optical bench uh, on the top, uh, the temperature in the spectrograph room, uh, the pressure and then the uh, actual drift over here. This is about a period of uh, about a year. Uh, you can see some of the um, then um, then uh, response in the drift, uh, depending on, I guess, what is occurring over here. There are a few events of interest over here. This is where we changed uh, the HPF H2RG controller to the Macy um, card, and then there was a response uh, in and change in the actual uh, power input uh, in, into um, the, the instrument. We changed the, the sort of equilibrium temperature off the bench. We see uh, a response here in the drift. Um, there was a power failure at the observatory over there, which clearly also shows a response in the drifts. And then uh, this is when we um, um, actually um, uh, did one of the LN2 um, fill line uh, pumping, which also uh, results in, a, in an RV uh, drift response. If we zoom actually in to uh, this gray region uh, over here, which is a period of about nine to 10 days, um, this is actually when it's performing um, or the drifts are uh, relatively uh, well behaved. Then uh, the temp this is the same sort of um, setup of, of plots showing the uh, temperature on the optical bench is maintained within uh, one millikelvin. Uh, the RMS is fantastic at uh, 0.2 millikelvin. Uh, spectrograph room pressure, and this is then the the sawtooth pattern uh, we've been talking about um, about um, 10 meter per second, which we need to uh, track uh, with the LFC to to to. And we have then a, a model that um, a drift model that uh, is. Uh, there are two main ways then to derive uh, the the drift. Either you re-derive it every every uh, single night, um, and then um, the wavelength solution, and that, um, and then you track it uh, across the night, and then then you re-derive it again. Um, we actually have a fairly static solution. Uh, build a template of the LFC, and then we track um, the drift from there. Uh, in the beginning, we were only using a, um, um, a, a zero order shift, uh, but then as time went uh, on, then we saw that we needed to build in um, then a linear and a quadrature scaling terms uh, to allow the template to 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 um, um, to uh, linearly and quadratically scale it. Primarily, we were primarily able to explain the the, the drifts with the pure um, pixel shifts, uh, but then uh, you can see here that the linear term is is um, um, is doing some work over here, and then there's only a marginally uh, the, uh, uh, where the uh, the second order scaling term is is doing. And this is further um, Joe's paper, uh, SPA paper in 2020. Um, Joe, do you want to then take it um, from here? Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, thanks, Kumi. So uh, what we were finding, uh, I actually, as we are tracking the drifts, one thing that you know, surprised us is that over a time we started seeing the the when we're trying to check whether our drifts are actually capturing the centroids of etlon and the laser frequency combs what we found is that the drift that we are measuring was different in different readout channels of the h2rg so as gumi earlier mentioned we use an h2rg detector and we read it in a four channel readout mode so the lower right corner diagram shows the directions in which each of those uh, detector channels are read out. And what we found was that, uh, which is what is shown on the top uh, left uh, plot, that there is almost like, like a four meter per second uh, drift, uh, which is seems to be like same for the channels which are read out in the same direction, uh, while opposite for the channels which are read out in opposite directions over like a long period, like something like you know, three years or so. It has been a slowly drifting uh, thing. And this discontinuity at the readout channel boundary was something we did not expect at all and but then it was clearly there in our data slightly uh, louder uh, sorry was there a question so you can try here but if we try and speak slightly louder otherwise no, i can also yeah. say a few words uh okay uh is yes, it this better, is better yes okay this is way better all right sorry uh, what I'm saying is that uh, as we were tracking the drift, we, what we found was that our readout channels were uh, 
the 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 seems like a drift in the instrument which was a function of the direction in which we are reading out the detector which is what is shown here like we have four channels of readout and we were finding that the segments of the spectrum inside each of the readout channel were drifting in the directions shown by the readout uh, uh, shown basically by the readout direction and this was quite puzzling to us um, so uh, ryan talked about this in the spi 2020 paper um, uh, we also saw that you know, in the effective interpixel capacitance that we measure, uh, this there is an asymmetry in the interpixel capacitance of our detector, and that also has been evolving. So that picture was sort of you know tying together, and it's not just in the uh, which is what is shown in the lower uh, right plot. Uh, you can see that the the interpixel capacitance was sort of asymmetrically changing over time over many years. Um, and this was also reflected in the CCFs. Like if you look at the CCF, you could see an asymmetry happening. So we didn't really have an idea of what is causing this. Uh, Gumi, can we go to the next slide? Uh, yeah, so uh, meanwhile, uh, unknown to us, the, the pedestal bias value of the detector was also changing, which went unnoticed for some time because we were the pipeline was automatically correcting it and nobody was actually carefully looking at the raw data. Uh, at that point and then we started realizing we have a problem when somebody accidentally observed a very bright star and we saw that you know, we started saturating in ADC uh, not at the non-linearity point. Uh, this was like a big uh, alarm ring and then we went back and looked at the non-linearity curve like on the lower left plot you can see that during the commissioning days we have more of a standard non-linearity curve on the x-axis shows the flux and on the y-axis shows the the delta change in the counts and as you can as you'd expect that when you go to higher counts the response basically drop that's a classical non-linearity but what we found is that even our non-linearity curve was drifting beneath us uh, this curve moved from what is shown on the left side to the what the curve on the right side and the right side curve is very weird in the sense that if we zoom into that uh, inner part, uh, you can see that the response actually increases and then drops, uh, which was also very puzzling. So, in 2022, when we did the thermal cycling of the detect uh, of the instrument, we uh, sort of like Chad replaced the Macy. So, by the way, we had switched to using the Macy controller instead of the Teledyne SAM. Uh, we switched back to Teledyne SAM and found that everything was back to normal. So, we sent back our Macy controller to the vendor. And they immediately identified a blown out capacitor and that completely fixed the issue. Uh, but this, uh, luckily, most of our observations, we never actually went to the high weld up region where the nonlinearity correction was important. But this was something uh, which sort of affected us. Uh, again, a, you know, a nod to the community because Teledyne has now stopped selling Teledyne uh, SAM cards. So Macy is now the default um, controller for all H2RGs for future instruments. Uh, something to watch out for. Uh, the next slide uh, shows, okay, so uh, many of these effects to understand in deep, uh, in depth, we also try to model the laser, uh, the line spread function of uh, the HPF instrument. So the our laser frequency comb has a feature where we can actually scan the F0 value and thereby basically sample different samplings of the of a pixel uh, basically a laser frequency or delta functions you're sampling through um, so what is shown on the right side is a super sampled uh, psf profile and how it varies across one of the hpf orders so you can see it goes from a fairly symmetric psf on one side to an asymmetric psf on the other side and this has implications as uh, shown in the next slide uh, because this affects like if you have a asymmetric psf then the question is how do you want to fit the centroid of that line uh so if we are yeah, yes maybe we you, we can just uh we have to wrap up maybe you can just right. uh, say okay. the takeaway message in uh 10 15 seconds uh yeah okay so maybe let's just go to the uh next slide i think we can discuss uh so we also have a non-linearity curve which is also available uh publicly and uh when we go to the next slide Gumi. Yeah, I, I think we'll just uh, have to uh, wrap up here, and then we have uh, then additional slides if 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 uh, people have questions. So maybe we'll sure, just wrap sure. up here, yeah, and then uh, we'll, if we'll be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much. So time for one or two questions. No question. 
Okay, maybe later in the discussion. So next speaker is Etienne. Etienne Artigo from Montreal. Did you unshare? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Works. Okay, it's, uh, it's hard enough to sum one instrument. So I'll summarize two instruments in 15 minutes. And so it's uh, basically years and years of work, problems, headaches, and fun. Sorry, it's fun. So uh, it's very, Okay, this okay. Okay, um, it's very personal take on it. There's probably more on data reduction than others because I've been really involved in two redu data reduction, of course. Uh, yeah, modal noise and so on, pipeline adventures, Tellurix. I have lots of backup slides. If you want to have fun on Tellurix, we I have tens of slides after that. Um, so, near Spirou, there are partly overlapping teams. So, there are well, big groups in. in uh, uh, within NIRPS, Montreal, Geneva, Grenoble, uh, Canary Islands, uh, Porto, and I'm sure I'm forgetting someone, uh, Natal in Brazil, uh, in Spirou, the, the big institution that is not in NIRPS is uh, Toulouse. Uh, and yeah, so, so it's overlapping teams and it has an impact on DRS because of course, there's the Apero software that's being used on, in both instruments. So Spirou started in 2000. Eight. It seems crazy to say that. Uh, it's at CFHT. It's been operating since 2018. It has a bigger fiber, more modes, lower resolution than NIRPS. It's a spectropolarimeter, which makes things more complex in terms of, of uh, image plane um, uh, line spread function. It has a pupil slicer, more, but as I said, complex line spread function. 2.2 pixel per, uh, 2.2 kilometer per second per pixel. It's borderline Nyquist, which is uh, an interesting topic. Uh, NIRPS was initiated later. Uh, it had a long story. There were two proposals to send to have a PRV instrument uh, uh, in La Silla, and it was initially a copy of Spirou at NTT. Lots of adventures. It became an infrared channel for HARPS. It has two fibers, uh, 84K, 72K, um, final sampling. So one thing that a big lesson learned is the modal noise is worse than we thought initially. There's a post on that, you can see it. We have two fiber, higher resolution, lower resolution. And if you do the math of the number of lambda over D, you have about this number of modes. It was identified early on as a risk, big risk. It does a lot of effort uh, to mitigate it. We go with stretching, scrambling, calibration. I can briefly go through that. I'll just show one test by Yolanda and the team where we, you agitate the fiber and you see at the output of both fibers, the modal noise evolution. And we see that on sky, it has obviously an impact on the, the, the RV if you, and the, even the flat fielding if you do nothing. So correction is a uh, multi-step approach. So there's out of the box. If you do nothing, just get it out of the box and inject the light, you have a 6% RMS structure in your data, that's a total killer for PRV. 2.5 if you go in HE, makes sense that it's smaller in high efficiency, there are more modes. Then you stretch the fiber, it's literally a mechanical stretch of the fiber to mix the mode, you gain factor two, three. Then you scramble with the AO, so you move the near field, so you have the scrambling, you get to sub percent, half a percent in the best case. And then you go on hot stars, that are also useful for the lyrics, and then it goes to in H, E, in some cases, we can go basically where we cannot even measure it and there's an additional RMS. But yeah, it's, and the, the magic number is at half a percent where you, you need to go there to be at the meter per second. And, and stuff. And then was there was this 2HE or not 2HE, that is the question, which I find so funny that I had to put it again. Uh, and we, we had long discussions within the team, which modes the best, is it better to gain in foot and lose a bit in RV content or gain or the other way around. And it ends up that if you get the mean nightly error versus the you know, two fibers on the same target, basically you win having more throughput rather than lose a bit in RV content. 
in that context, you have less modal noise also, as I showed uh, in, in, the, in the numbers. So there's still a need for HA. I'm not saying we throw it away, but it seems to be the preferred mode for, for um, PRV. Yeah. We have a lower resolution than we thought initially for all sorts of reasons. reasons. One thing is that the H, especially HA, we were supposed to be at 100,000, we're at 86,000. And there's a um, degradation of, of, of image quality on one side of the array. We do not understand. It is not a tilt of the great uh, of the focal plane, and we we still optical designers are still puzzling, still puzzled by that one. It doesn't affect that much if you do the error propagation, but it's lower resolution than we thought, especially in HE that is lower. So the image quality difference doesn't impact that much. Um, Lessons learned from Spirou pipeline development. We had an incredibly naive, uh, we were so naive regarding the pipeline and we thought, and I swear we were in uh, Grenoble and we said, said in a week, we get a true Harps pipeline. And that's good, it's done, the Harps pipeline works. It took about the equivalent of five FTEs to do that in the end. Okay, it's probably the best uh, underestimation of anything that we'll see here. Uh, we got it true, but uh, okay. And it, yeah, so for NIRPS, there's a tale of two pipelines, so it's a long story. We have the Geneva team that uses a pipeline derived from Espresso with Telluric correction. You heard uh, Romain Allard. Montreal, we use Apero that is, was written for Spirou initially, but it was really thought with the idea of adding other instruments. And so you can see Neil Cook's poster. One is in C, one is in Python, and there's a requirement from ESO to really like have the data reduce on the fly. And Apero uses a lot of libraries, a lot of things. So Apero is not easily done on the fly, so the, the, the differences in the way we work, but this one meets the requirement of being nearly on the fly. Um, Telluric correction differs between the two, so espresso by you saw it, it's Romain's talk. Apero, we, we do something very similar to what Romain does, and then we go with a library of hot stars, so you say that there's a saying like all models are wrong, some models are useful, so we, we just know what models will be wrong, but we use hot stars to calibrate. Let's say, let's say your line, your, your water features are broadened too much in your telluric absorption model. Then in your hot stars, you'll see the imprint of that error. And then you can feed back in into your model of telluric absorption. So you basically do a first pass. Why not? You, have, you know it's, it's water, but then you add an extra term. And we also correct, and that's a long story, and I still want, it's unpublished, so I'm working on the paper, finite resolution effect. So you think you know how to do tellurics, you have a perfect measurement of your star, but the absorption happens at infinite resolution. You measure and correct it at finite resolution. It injects structure, even if you have a perfect knowledge of your star spectrum and the telluric. Okay. So there are ways, and I could get into that. I don't want to get too far because it's, it's, I'm writing the paper, but yeah, so we correct for that already. You require a library for hot stars and on the fly, that's, and the jury is still out on the true impact of the two methods. That's one thing we want to do with Romain sometimes. So uh, yeah, it has been incredibly valuable. So I'd say funding one pipeline is hard enough. So saying to you, just no, no, fund two pipelines. I agree, it is not a super helpful suggestion to you all to have two pipelines, but it's great if you have to. Uh, we found all sorts of problems that we had all sorts of confirmations that drift of the Fabri Perot, we're super happy we had the same. We found problems with background because one had it, not the other one. We found problem with hollow cathodes, one had it, not the other one, and so on. I could go, yeah, so it's, it's magic to have two pipelines. It's also magic to have the same pipeline on two instruments, which is the case for Apero on, that basically being used on Nips and Spirou. It's been made to be portable, so it was ported to the other one. You share all the recipes, the, the inner working of the algorithms, but of course you have a profile that defines how the apero behaves on your version. And then you, you know that you cannot blame the pipeline for the differences between the instruments. And I have a very editorial comment with no proof of it, but I'm sure that we have lots of differences between instruments that are not due to the instrument, but the way we reduce the data. But that's very hard to prove because you'd have to reduce with the other instruments. So it's, yeah, it's a totally non-scientific say, but yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that it's the, it's the case. So Spirou as a, for PRV, so we have best sequences around two, two and a half meter. The f so here's an example with TY1452 where we have modest GPs, let's say, so there may be activity, there may be also dr uncorrected drifts 
in. So we have modest GPs, which is good news in terms of drifts that would be uncorrected in the data. Um, NIRPS, it's, and I'll get to the, uh, we were talking about exposure time, so I'll get to that. It has, so we demonstrated meter per second a little better. It has really good stability. So we're, I think, actually did the math and adding the FPs would worsen things, actually, a bit because of modal noise. That's a long story, but actually we think that not having FP simultaneously is better. But you have the sky, that's a bonus. But then actually the FP, if you propagate the noise, it's actually worsening things rather than having a proper wavelength solution at the beginning and the end of the night in the show. Uh, why are the two instruments not the same accuracy? Short answer, you don't really know. And we really still have to do a proper propagation of errors all the way through. Okay, if that's, and I'll show you the differences in the, my trumpet plot. And there are all sorts of interesting things and it's still to be understood. So there's a difference in sampling, there's a difference in, um, yeah, so detector effects, if you have the, the effects on the detector in pixel, of course it scales with your sampling. So bigger pixels are a bad thing in general. Uh, pupil slicing, at least you cannot blame the pipeline. It's at least the pipeline could be wrong twice, but it's wrong the same. Well, now it's not wrong, Neil, don't panic. <laughs> so here are my trumpet plots, and I realize it's more a clarinet on this one on NIRPS because there was a suggestion to produce the, the, the plot. So the, the differences, so I, I put the integration time because we were discussing, okay, integration times, I, I, it's 1.3 meters per second in 300 seconds, 2.5 in 60 seconds. Obviously it's Barnard star, what else? There's uh, the, the impact of Y band, which was discussed. Yeah, it's, it's clearly better in, in NIRPS. We have a better throughput at, the, um, at the, the blue end of the domain, clearly. Of course, Piru, you have K band, it's, it's a, a game. Um, also, if for those that are really into infrared astronomy, uh, you notice that we can go into the, the, the bands here between J and H and at the edge of H, which is harder in La Silla also, water. Uh, H4RGs are total messes. I won't get into that. Uh, I'll just show you one thing. This is on Spirou, there's something really nice. There, there are five amplifiers of the 32 on the detector that are not illuminated. The, 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 the data is like 4,000 by 3,000 pixels. And you have this dark area where there should be nothing. And you see these spaghettis there. And they are actually capacitive coupling crossed up between amplifiers. And well, you see it there because there's nothing, but it's also on your science data. So we correct it with the dark area in Spirou, which we thought would just be thrown away, but it became really useful. And it's a, actually pretty tough to do that on NIRPS that fills really the array. Uh, so that's a before after of the, the correction. Anyway, persistence, if you want, uh, let's take time for questions, but I could discuss persistence. The detector is like your eyes when you, 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 you have uh, uh, the lights from a car, it remembers what it has seen. And it's really bad if you go from one target, right, to another target, faint, that are within about a full width half max. Okay, there's a, there's a co coherent and incoherent persistence. So if you, the worst case is like you have three kilometers per second offset between your bright and then after faint target. So anyway, yeah, questions. Too many things. <laughs> Go. <laughs> yeah, I could leave the slides actually. Thank you, Etienne. So, Hanska. Thanks a lot. I have a comment and a question. The comment is that in Carmenus, we actually see this crosstalk thing. We have a couple of hot pixels everywhere and they, they are sort of mirrored everywhere. I mean, apparently randomly on the detector, but not randomly. So we have a very complex crosstalk pattern that we had to find out and that we are correcting now. I suppose you have the same, right? Yeah. Right. And, and, my, and my, my question is, uh, you said that with FP, it's, it's lower performance. So there's a lot of uh, contamination. How, how, um, how much, is, how large is the contamination? What's the ratio? And how, how large is the separation of the, of the fiber? Uh, Thank you. 
Okay, maybe we will stop here. So thank you, Etienne. Uh, there was a question by Claire uh, for HPF, but uh, maybe we keep it for uh, the discussion and we switch to Masayuki about IRD. Okay, let's go. Hi, it's Zach. I'm happy for sharing our lesson with you, and uh, uh, I'd like. Uh, I hope that our lesson can help you. I, I'm Masaki Kuzuhara from a ABC and now NOJ. I'd like to ask you to remember the name of the IRD at least because it is sometimes missed in particular by op optical spect spectrograph people. So first, I'd like to explain the theoretic correction in our RB calculation pipeline. So we use radar frequency com LFC, and uh, we get uh, instrumental profile IP by the of the LFC spectra. And uh, the IP are used to convolve the serial spectra, uh, sorry, decomvolve the serial spectrum. Uh, and then we fit theoric, uh, we correct the theoric absorption features with the uh, theoretical model or rapid rotator spectra. And the uh, multi epoch theoric corrected spectra are combined into a single master template spectra. The template spectra is convolved with the IP uh, to compare that with the st stellar spectrum. And then we fit, re, we refit the theoric absorption uh, with the same process, and derive, we finally derived RB. These are our RB calculation uh, process and uh, process of theoric correction. Uh, this slide shows the performance of theoric correction. Uh, we are now testing how well our pipeline can uh, model the theoric spectra. Uh, the detail of the, the this test is presented in by the poster of the Yui Kasaki, who is now joining this meeting. Therefore, I'd like to ask you to see her poster. Uh, we, in the test, we simulate multi epoch M dwarf spectra with observed spectra of rapid rotators for theoretical absorption and the theoretical spectra for uh, M dwarf uh, spectra. And then we apply uh, our pipeline to the simulated spectra. This figure shows the result of the test. Uh, X axis shows the epochs in which we observe the rapid rotators. And the right axis, uh, so vertical axis shows the RB measurement. Uh, I'd like to ask you to just see the red point. Uh, the scatter of the red point means that there is a, uh, the scatter of a red point means that there, there is an imperfect model in the theory correction. And the uh, scatter is about 2.5 meter per second RMS. And then the internal error is about 2.3 meter per second. In, in that case, that contribution from imperfect modeling of theoretic spectra is about 
one meter passing gun. This is a limitation in our theoretic collection. And the, this is the first lesson I'd like to ex yeah, dis explain. The next po point is a little bit tricky, uh, which is artificial RB offset. So uh, we divide our spectra into a lot of segments. And in each segment, we measure the RB. So if uh, I'm now assuming that the uh, signal to noise ratio SNL of the LSC spectra is now poor at that segment. And if there is a, a lot of absorption line in the, that segment, the RB information contribution is significant. In that case, uh, impact on total RB is uh, significant. If signal to noise ratio of the LSC spectra is poor. In, meanwhile, if the RB information contribution is poor, for example, if you have uh, little absorption in that segment, the contribution is poor, and if then signal to noise ratio of LSC spectra is poor, it, the impact on total RB is small. It is not problem, problematic, but uh, uh, low, low point is uh, significant on the impact of the uh, total RB. Then uh, our data frequency comb are uh, sometimes a variable uh, as in this figure. Uh, this figure shows the wave variation of the LFC uh, power. You can see uh, the strong variation around this wavelength range. So therefore, if, the, uh, if we make the RB as that poor LFC segment, uh, it, it produces a systematic error on the total RV. So wavelength of LFC emissions are stable in our observation, but the strengths of the LFC are sometimes variable at some wavelengths. So therefore, the second rest, we need to take care of LFC brightness stability depending on wavelengths. Uh, actually, we found a systematic RV offset from this effect. This figure shows the uh, RB measurement of all target uh, that starts from 19, 2019 to 2023. And uh, all RB measurement for all survey target are plotted with a uh, blue point. And the black crosses correspond to the uh, median of the RB measurement at, at each epoch for all, at each epoch. So by taking median, we can cancel the uh, effect of the activity and the signal from planet. Therefore, the black point correspond to the uh, systematic RB offset uh, from instrument. Uh, so you, you can see the negative offset after 2022 data, uh, in the 2022 data. So this means that there are systematic offset in our RB measurement due to the variation of laser frequency comb. We correct the offset in a post process where we subtract the median RB at each epoch from the individual RB for all the target. The third point is activity analysis at the near infrared. We also use the FWHM, BIS, and other activity indicators as used in the other survey. Uh, this figure shows the periodogram analysis on RB, RB residual BI. S and FWHN for a target observed by TESS and K2. We detected the outside planet and we reported it recently in Hiranato 2023. The red dashed point, uh, sorry, red dashed line correspond to the rotation period of the that star, but you see no significant peak around that red dashed line. So this as in this figure, line shape analysis should not be necessarily sensitive to rotation period and activity, or at least quiet to start. I think this is consistent with the other survey. However, we can reproduce photometry based rotation period for very active stars such as AUB. So, as lesson three, activity indicator can be used to confirm there is no signal, no, no signal consistent to planet orbit. 
period. And maybe photometry is more useful. I'd like to briefly show the uh, interesting finding, which is activity uh, analysis at near, uh, sorry, which is line depth ratio. Line depth ratio is defined as in this figure. Uh, line depth ratio R becomes smaller, the influence, so uh, uh, as the activity, an act, sorry, as the line depth ratio R becomes smaller, the influence or curl spot is larger at near infrared for active m as our finding. This right figure shows the uh, line depth ratio depending on wavelengths. So you can see that the line depth ratio is the smallest at H band. With this calculation, uh, we can predict uh, how much RB data occurs as in this uh, right figure. So this figure shows the uh, location of the uh, curl spot on the disk uh, along x axis and the y axis show the variation of RB. Uh, red, blue curve correspond to H band RB variation and red curve correspond to uh, RB variation at Y band. RB data is four to five times larger in the H band than in the Y band. Uh, th this is because uh, line depth ratio is uh, smallest in the H band. I'd like to ask you to check the uh, Terry Kihano's talk tomorrow for the detail of this uh, finding. Finally, I'd like to show uh, the relation between fiber injection efficiency, FYE, and RB error. Uh, this figure shows the uh, RB error uh, at 30 minute exposure time. And uh, X axis show the effective temperature of the ta or, or uh, survey target. So you see that RB error amplitude of RB error almost flat and not depend is not depend on dependent on the effect temperature. Or you, I think you see that uh, RB error uh, is a little bit higher at the low temperature start. RB error should be improved by targeting m with smaller temperatures because such cool cold stars have uh, more absorption line in the H band. But there should be no improvement as our uh, observation. This is because fiber injection efficiency is not good for such small temperature target. Uh, this right figure shows the uh, FYE as a function of effective temperature, you see that significant drop of FYE at about 3.1 thousand Kelvin. This is because the performance of adaptive optics, uh, which is used in IRD, is worse for rate, later m dwarfs because uh, adaptive optics use optical band for the correction of wave, wave front error. This limits the IRD performance for such te low temperature start. If we FYE in, is improved by factor of three for such uh, low temperature start, we predict the RB error can be decreased by 1.3 for such low temperature MDOF. Therefore, as a fourth lesson, um, to maximize the uh, sen sensitivity to the such uh, low temperature stars, we require infrared wave front sensor. Then, yes, we have other influence to the other, pro yeah, other problem, but we skip because uh, time is, is Time does not remain, and we uh, we have a slide about the uh, long-term RB stability for DJ six nine nine and uh, loss five zero eight. Uh, around loss five zero eight, we reported the planet. Uh, this is summary. Thank you. And take let's uh, let me take question. Thank you very much. Okay, maybe we will go to. Um, thanks for for your updates. Uh, do you have a constraint on how stable the LFC uh, amplitude has to be, like it, the percentage or whatever? Uh, what 
what kind of uh, stability do you need for the LFC? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So we tested uh, uh, the LFC, original LFC stability uh, in laboratory uh, before uh, we we uh, transfer the uh, radar frequency comm system into to Hawaii. And uh, yes, we use the technique to interferometer and uh, I, sorry, I don't remember uh, the amplitude of, of uh, stability, but it is very stable. Uh, I think it is cent centimeter level or something like, Kotai, Kotai do you remember? Sorry, okay. Uh, can you repeat first? Um, so the LFC stability. So then, in, the, in terms of uh, the radial velocity, it's a ten centimeter per second level. But the stability of the, your, your question is that the how the amplitude. The, yeah, okay. Um, so it it depends, but um, sometimes, or for example, twenty or thirty percent amplitude at variation we see. Um, yeah. And uh, it, it's not the same. Uh, it, it's not always the same. It's sometimes stable, it's sometimes very um, variable. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Rene, you have a question? It's actually, it's actually related. I'm very, it's very interesting the, the how the, you mentioned that the variation of the intensity of LFC affects the RV, but how much, maybe I missed it, the, how much does it vary in, in meters per second in your wavelength solution? What systematic effect does that create? I think this figure uh, shows the uh, yes show the amplitude of, of the systematic offset. I in the worst case, I think it is about ten meter per second. Well, yeah, along this, for example, you can see that around twenty twenty two, the offset is offset correspond to ten meter per second level. So this. Uh, we can correct this offset, but in the post press, as I said, but uh, we can correct, we can improve this point by updating a software. This is a co co problem that is a combination of software and uh, LSC uh, yeah, instrument. If we can correct, correctly treat such uh, bad segment, we, we, are improve, we can improve this point. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if there is any instrument that wants to, infrared instrument that wants to report, or if not, we will start the discussion. Um, Claire, are you online to, to ask your question to Joe? Yes, uh, I'm online and I have another question. I have a couple of questions actually. Uh, maybe uh, I will start with uh, the one, can you hear me? Can you speak a little bit louder, please? Yeah, of course. Um, so my first question would be uh, related to what was asked before on the LFC variations, giving uh, radial velocity variations. Um, my question is, um, how, how is it with stars? Because we are uh, moving from um, different magnitude stars during the night. So if a flux variation makes a radial velocity variation, why not with the stars? Uh, do, does someone has uh, an answer to that? Is it for any specific instrument or um, LFC in general? Yeah, I, I think it's general. So Hans go. I think the difference is that the, the LFC changes its shape, right? The spectral energy distribution is shape is changing ra radically. I mean, the, the, the flattening device is not working properly. That is, that's the problem, right? And the stars are not changing their SED. They're just getting brighter and darker. So you can you can template match or whatever kind of calibration method you're using, but with the LFC, it doesn't work because you're really changing the slope everywhere. And that really moves around the very center of, of the individual lines. So no other instrument is, uh, is, uh, is having uh, radial velocity variations in the calibration channel or in the st stellar channel that is related to flux. Is it right? Mm. 
Uh, maybe I should mention that in HPF, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, a yeah. uh, little bit yeah. louder too. Uh, okay, uh, so in HPF, we had like found that the, because of the laser frequency com line variation at one side of the order where the PSF is a bit asymmetric, uh, there is some centroid shift happening. So we switched to not doing a weighted fit, which means that we are, uh, you know, you keep the chi-square symmetric irrespective of the flux level of the LFC that helped us really improve the stability of the centroids derived from the laser frequency comb basically by doing a non-optimal centroid fit of the laser frequency comb lines uh, so uh, that really helped us because without that we were seeing a even larger uh, sensitivity of the flux i mean we still have the sensitivity as was pointed out the biggest issue was the scd of the lfc changes significantly uh, but even though most of that can be taken out by the spectral flatteners in laser frequency combs they are still not very efficient that the, the short frequency uh, positions. Okay, Claire, do you want to ask your question about uh, persistence? Yeah, I was wondering uh, whether HPF or IRD are um, uh, bothered with the persistence on the detector and what do you do about it? Joe, do you want to take that? Um, I mean, we have uh, attempted a persistent correction, but um, Joe, maybe you might be the best person to to answer that on on the persistence. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, okay. So if we we have issues with the persistence. Uh, I actually shared one plot in the Slack channel, which shows the persistent thing. We tried fitting it with the power law, and that had like you know mixed. Things we are not, we are like I would say, not very successful yet. Uh, right now, we are just dealing it with operationally, like the QO operators were told not to observe any targets, and we have like live monitoring of the flux level as an exposure happens, so that even if somebody accidentally puts a wrong target, uh, they don't end up saturating more than 70% of the well in operation. And that being said, over the last four years. There have been at least three nights uh, where we had to call off the HPF from rest of the night because one star was observed, which went more than 70% uh, of the well depth or so. So we try to deal that operationally by preventing uh, people from observing a bright target with the instrument. But uh, we we do have this empirical uh, power law model, which we try to scale and subtract for a couple of targets. But I think the, I mean, you may remember it was not very successful, right? Or we had some partial success. Yeah, I mean, we we had some, I would say, partial success on using the the simple uh, persistence model. Um, it improved the RVs marginally, uh, so we would have to take a closer look at um, closer look at that definitely. Okay, uh, Claire, do you have other questions, or do we shift to the list of? Uh points that you wanted to discuss? Yeah, I don't have other questions, but yeah, maybe in the room there, there are some questions. I, I just listed that because I, I thought it was a common questions we may have, but uh, yeah. Okay, so who wants the mic about any of these questions? Etienne, of course. <laughs> I have a, a half, half comment, half questions regarding persistence to all the other teams. So if you look at the arithmetic of persistence, it's a strong function of the consecutive, but of course, brightness. So you go to a bright target, you go to a thin target, that's that. But it's a very strong function of the relative RV, including BERV, of course, it's like, Basically, you're, it's an M dwarf. You do Barnard because you always do Barnard. And then you go to a faint TOI object. And if you look at it, if you propagate into your noise budget, the Barnard spectrum leaking onto your next target, it's a very strong function of, of where they are relative to each other. Worst case being just like one full width of half a full width half max away because your Barnard leaks on the, the, the side of your lines. 
in a coherent way because it's the same lines, well, modulum metallicity, but it's the same lines, and that's bad. And if you look, if, as I had fun doing simulations where you walk your Barnard spectrum onto your, your, your other, other object, and there's a, there's a big difference, uh, at least a factor 10 being between an incoherent addition of the, of the Barnard leaking onto your other object and a coherent addition where you're within like two kilometers per second. So if you want to go into scheduling, you could say, well, you have to do the math and know the systemic velocities and know the BEV and so on, but you could predict worst case scenarios and avoid like total velocity collisions, let's say. So we haven't done it. No one, I don't know if anyone's done it, but it would be logical if we want to mitigate it. So if anyone does that or? It's, a fully, it's probably not that hard to, to schedule if you know the systemic velocities, you know where you point, you know the night, and you probably don't need to account for the Earth's rotation in the belt. It's just only the, uh, the, 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 the or Earth's orbit, so you, you don't need to know when in the night you're going to observe. And so you can predict that TOI something and Barnard tonight would be in a bad scenario. So, so just anyone doing that? As we discussed in NIPS about it, discussed, I think. But yeah. Anybody? Oh. One in the back. So, so the iLocator team simulated this when we were trying to specify H4IG requirements. Um, and we basically, there is a mitigation of doing different spectral types and coordinating your observing plans. I think my question is sort of, this is mitigation of current generation instruments. How low do we need to go in terms of the intrinsic persistence of the detectors to not have to worry about this? And like, what is that number that it doesn't become a problem? And that's kind of looking at it from a tech development project. Is this something that we need to say, hey, this is going to be an issue. Do we need to do a detected development plan? So that's going to take years. And is it something we should be, be pushing on that one? So I think, you know, there's mitigation strategies, but do we think that that's going to be enough to get us where we need to be is kind of a question, I think, from a asking funding agencies, should they be something they're investing in? Like we kind of went, Roman has invested a lot of money in solving this because they have a strong science case for their like lensing of science. So we're benefiting from it, but just, I don't know at what level of the physical intrinsic like persistence level on the detectors that it doesn't become a problem for us and we can solve it. Uh, Etienne, maybe do you want to mention the LED flash flashing? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll mention two things. I thought of mentioning one thing, but not that, but uh, yeah. Uh, I did the math for some Spirou nights, and if you're, in most cases, you're like, at the, you can do the arithmetic, it's pretty simple, and you just take the other spectrum, you can even assume Gaussian, and you just, worst case, you're, basically, it's your flux ratio contaminating, so you, let's say you have a 10 minus 4 decrease, so it decreases by, by uh, 10 to the 4, but then you have your brightness ratio that can pump it up, uh, and, and the, it, so you're, if you're set by a kilometer per second, and you have a leakage at one in a thousand, so the flux ratio that gets you to, a then you have your meter per second, and then that's the problem. And most cases, if you take a, a just random night where no one cared, you're, you're at like 10 centimeters per second, you don't, and it's, it's fine. So I think if you're re minimally careful, you can have it to a level where we don't care. Then we have another idea we're exploring with NIPS is that you cannot get rid of persistence. You can reset your array a thousand times, it won't get rid of it but you can replace an unknown persistence by a known persistence and flash flood the array and have always the same thing because you just refill the wells basically. So we're exploring that now with uh, Spiro. I, I just want to add that you're giving your perspective from PRV and I completely yeah. agree, but you know, we're also very much interested to do abundance measurements. And so these persistence just dilutes the, the line. So then you can kind of play the game of uh, scheduling the, uh, so. <laughs> Yes, yes. Rose? Uh, maybe this is a question for Joe, but I'm curious, and maybe this is a dumb question, but um, is there an ideal uh, orientation for the shell versus the readout um, channels? Like, is, is that something that anyone has thought about? 
like if there are drifts being introduced by the readout channels, do we just rotate the detector 90 degrees and, and get rid of that? I don't know. Um, I, I should mention that we were, first of all, not expecting this uh, asymmetric behavior with the readout and we hope that no, this is a one-off case and will not happen again because the course was identified to be a leaky blown out capacitor in the electronics. So assuming this does not happen all the time, uh, the, there was definitely some advantages in the bias correction, uh, depending on where you are, how your dispersion order is, because you get to actually use those orders where you have no, I mean, the pixels where you do not have light for doing better uh, bias subtraction because the four reference pixels on the side of H2RGs are uh, statically not sufficient to remove all the bias noise that you see in the detector. So there is definitely some advantage. I think it, it, I think depending on how much is the filling fraction of your spectrum on the detector, there are some optimization games one can play uh, for not just the readout direction RV effect, but also for the bias removal. Uh. If, if you have the luxury of not filling the detector, okay? Yeah, well, Spirou by luck, because I think we did not appreciate it when we just got the, the orders under the array, you have th that butterfly effect. So that, that basically you read in a direction and you have like a rippling effect in the other amplifiers. So if we, so we have the amplifiers in the same direction as the, orders and you see the pattern from all the ampli all the orders onto the dark amplifiers but if we had it rotated 90 degrees it wouldn't work it's it's luck eh? we've got that's a 50 50 chance of getting it wrong but we had it right and so in that case if you're not filling the area the area entirely you want that a dark area to to have full amplifiers without anything on it and if there's just one yeah there's a rotation <laughs> That then it becomes a, a problem of cross dispersion and, and, and feeling like with NIRPS, if you either have a dark region or you just cram your, you get your, your, your orders too tight and it's not working. So yeah, if you can have it, yeah. Okay, uh, maybe one, uh, you want to add something? I have a good question. Okay. Um, I have a question for the teams who are using adaptive optic systems with your instruments. Have you noticed any connections with the way that you are using the adaptive optics or the way it's performing and uh, whatever happens? And I guess a two part question, do you, do you do anything besides just trying to like feed as much light as you can in, like, do you have any weird smearing or anything else you do? Yes, you are, uh, yes, your, I think your question is, uh, if we, we use adaptive optics, we get modern noise. So we are using adaptive optics because uh, we need uh, we need to uh, make the uh, spectrograph smaller. Yes, that that is uh, one of the limit for our team. But Kotaisan, do you have any other answer? So we 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 use adaptive optics to um well. As our Kuzhasan said, uh, to to com to to make the spectrometer compact, but um, so we use uh, so we in 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 terms of operation, we usually uh, optimize the fiber injection efficiency, and 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 uh, not we we do not use uh, for example um, intentional uh, well treating uh, image positions. Um, maybe we can do that and for further reducing. Uh, the modern noise, but uh, for the moment, we uh, we 
do not use that um, the special uh, AO operation. But for sometimes we um, uh, we 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 use the adaptive optics uh, with very low gain, adapt AO gain. Uh, when we observe very bright star, uh, for example, a rapid rotator, something like that, and to avoid uh, the persistence as much as as much as as possible. The opinion of young people. We for NIRPS use like a flower pattern to change the injection in the fiber. Yeah. So we tested to see like if we should avoid the centroid, which we don't because it doesn't make so much difference. And like also we changed the radius and like the pattern has been updated recently also to really optimize this injection. Yeah, to already scramble before it goes into the fiber to reduce the model noise also. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's very simple. I mean, you have an AO system you, you, and your tip tilt signal, your tip tilt, you can control it. So the uh, on the 3.6, we have a lambda over D of about 0.13 arc second, lambda over D spread of about 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Uh, but our fiber is much larger, about 0.3 arc second, 0.4 arc second. So you can just scan around. So during an exposure, we just go around randomly. Uh, yeah, and it works. Yeah, uh, sorry? Well, it's, it's because we have model noise, right? So if you're always at the same place, uh, you'll have the same model noise, but by moving slightly, then you smear the model noise. But we're still left with some, and this is why we have the the scrambler, and, and it, it, there's still some model noise at the end left over and with that we calibrate with a uh, fast rotating star and that we also use for Tellery, yeah. So, sorry, it, last point. Ultimately, I mean, in AO system, you'd like to use a single node fiber. So uh, this is high spec, we'll do that very soon. Uh, Ristretto, um, uh, eye locator, ultimately that's what you want. You know, you won't have any model noise, but then you really need to have you know, a good strel and to have a good injections. So I can't tell you about the spectrograph for iLocator yet because it's not finished, but we do have the fiber injection system at the LBT. So this is going directly into single mode fibers. So if you're going directly into single mode, the goal is as stable as possible with all of the wavelengths smack bang on top of each other. Um, the <clears throat> diffraction limit obviously is linear, um, but the single mode fiber sort of cord doesn't quite grow linearly. So there's a bit of a trade-off there in terms of optimization, but generally for our locator, we're just trying to get everything to be diffraction limited on top of each other as stable as possible. That causes fun for atmospheric dispersion correction um, where we are um, and testing it is kind of hard. Um, but we've we've demonstrated that and tip tilt and keeping things stable is kind of the challenge. So it kind of really depends on what you're doing with AO. Um, but if we're going directly into single mode, it's like you want to just not know the AO system is there and everything just stays stable is the goal. Okay, maybe in the, the five minutes that are remaining, we can discuss a little bit how, uh, so what is good for the near infrared, what is good for the optical, and maybe also the last question, what is the correct way to combine data from both channels? So maybe how many people you want to give an idea because you have both. So I don't know if you combine them or you just use one of them. Yeah, I don't know if we can say anything about the correct way, certainly. Um... No, we, so far we, we are getting two individual results. You can you can get your RVs for all the orders. You can get your RVs for two spectrographs. You can sort them whatever you like. And we are we are trying to. I mean, we are every everyone is doing their weighted RVs, I suppose. Uh, and you can weight them as you as you as you like. And that's what we are doing. So we are essentially um, using essentially every order as an as an as an order across uh, spectrographs we are not for for now you have seen that we are rarely using the neomat which is which has several reasons one of the reasons is that it has never been so stable as the other spectrographs um for for reasons for technical reasons um 
but also that for the early MDOS that we are mainly doing, uh, the information, the additional information content wasn't so high. We don't have a K band. Uh, that's also a reason we are fairly inefficient in the Y band. So the near infrared Kymanis um, instrument is not adding that much information. But I would say um, just use all the orders as, as in, in a normal, uh, in, in, if you had one spectrograph, or I don't think it, it I don't think we, we need to make this differentiation. Uh, lambda is continuous, and uh, you can see where it, where things work. Yeah, what I mean by that is that uh, activity, for example, is decreasing when you go to the near infrared. So, but maybe the the accuracy is uh, is worse. So, I I yeah I I don't buy that. I don't think activity is dis decreasing in the in the infrared. Simply, I mean, this is something. No, this is something that that you need to find out on every individual star. So it is definitely increasing in many stars. This is what we see in the data. But you cannot go out and, and take a star and and say, okay, I know that it's gone in the infrared, and it's not gone anywhere. So I don't think we have a star where you really have zero um, radial velocity change. We have seen many plots where it is suggested that a strong radial velocity uh, amplitude is vanishing in the infrared, but most of them are not simultaneously. So if you have simultaneous data, most of the time you see that the amplitude is, is reducing and it's not vanishing. And in some stars, it's actually larger. And this is in interesting astrophysical information. And the reason to build an infrared spectrograph is to get this astrophysical information and not to hope that every signal will be gone if you go red. But for example, I presented the case of ADLEO where you have this uh, SOFI data and SOFI normally has an accuracy of one to two meter per second and you have a 20 meter per second amplitude. It's, yeah. So, so you mean that when we took the data with uh, Spiru, we were lucky that it was quiet or? So I, I don't know why, why you don't see the signal in, the, in, the, in Spiru. Uh, one interesting, so we, we, I, I have to check, but I'm pretty sure that in AD Leo, we see in the infrared RV signal. Otherwise we would definitely have published it because we have done AD Leo up and down so many times and we, it really is one of our pet stars. And I'm pretty sure that we see in, in the IR amplitude of, of whatever signal you can see there. And it's not going away. Um, the interesting thing about uh, Spiru could be uh, that, uh, that the signal that you are not seeing is actually dominated by the CO bands. The CO bands are Zeeman insensitive. They have no, I don't know, uh, uh, no Zeeman broadening. And maybe you actually hit the spot and, and uh, did the right thing with the CO band, this would be spectacular if you could show that you are not seeing the RV excursion because you are doing CO. I, I would love to see that. I, I feel bad because we probably have the data and probably have not looked, at, well, absolutely have not looked at that, but in the LBL, we produce per little tiny domain uh, bin, so you can bin as you want. And we, I think we have one about there. And, uh, yeah, well, I'll check. But it's, yeah, it, it could be, uh, the paper is submitted, so it could be a sequel to, to, to it. And, and Zeeman broadening has a, a flux also component, and it's worsening in the red. So that's also one reason why you, yeah. I, I just want, uh, just for the first question, what, is, what, what are the fundamental illumination? To me, it's, it's obvious this is uh, telluric lines. I mean, we've learned it the hard way. And all the improvement we've made with time with Pew was because we have a be better telex subtraction and also systematic effects. Infrared detectors has, are messy. They are not CCDs, and they are all kinds of uh, uh, you know nasty things, persistence, uh, intrapixel responses, etc. But one thing we haven't discussed, and to me, which is even more fundamental, are the data pipelines. We have very complex instruments and also very complex data pipelines, and. Ideally, a planet you know, would satisfy the following criteria for to be genuine. It would be detected by different instrument with different pipeline, but first and foremost, it would be detected by different teams, different pipeline on the same data set. We haven't done that test much, actually. We've been starting with the LBL framework, looking at other data sets, and poof, suddenly some planets disappear. You know, it's uh, it's stellar activity or systematic effect, and so 
it's a very complex issue. So at some point we should organize a data challenge where we throw out our public data and let others analyze else, uh, others' data to see whether some claim planets by others or survive or not. Okay, thank you, Renee. So I think that we have to wrap up 